All right, Ned, one more company I want to talk about. All right. That is an infrastructure company called Pensando Systems. They are somewhat network oriented. And I characterized them at the top of the show as like a startup juggernaut, an emerging monster. And, and why would I categorize them that way? Well, the founders, if you look at the people who started Pensando Systems, they have a track record of companies that went on to be these multi-billion dollar products, um, typically Cisco products. So for example, mm. they were called Insimi. They started that, which was bought and became Cisco ACI. And they helped start the company that ended up being the Cisco UCS product line. And, and there's some other winners there along the way as well. And so as they were doing the opening, hi, this is who we are and what we do. They kind of led with that. Like, look, we've been awesome in the past. We've created a new thing. So it too shall be awesome, which uh, we'll see. Let's talk about it, Ned. Let's talk about it. So let me give you the background of what Pensando is. So first of all, they're a hardware and software system. Um, the hardware is a smart NIC, a smart network interface card. So it's got a chip on it that you can program to do all kinds of things and then offload those functions, whatever you program that chip to do from the x86 box. Sure. And th that's not new, right? There's smart NICs out there from a variety of companies, Mellanox, Netronome, and some other ones come to mind. Um, Pensando's chip was designed with... Um, uh, they wanted very high performance. They wanted this thing to be very fast, but they also wanted it to be able to handle very large data centers that might need millions of flow entries. A flow entry being, how do I get from this source on the network to this destination on the network? How do I do that? And uh, also being able to layer in like filtering, like for security and such. Well, you need a chip that can handle millions of flow entries for that. So they built this ARM chip and slapped it on this NIC. So they have this, so they got, ASIC or, you know, chip designer kind of people. Um, they made the chip programmable with P4, which is an emerging uh, network programming language. It's vaguely like OpenFlow, if you remember hearing people talk about OpenFlow some time ago, but it's quite a bit, quite different than that and uh, has gotten a lot of following. So with that chip, the ability to program with P4, a smart NIC that you plug into a server, they have then added a policy orchestration engine, you know, that goes on top of that and manages all this whole fleet of smart NICs that you're going to have out there in your data center. So you don't really kind of like you'd manage a fleet of servers, um, you know, with a, a fleet of hypervisors, uh, vSphere hypervisors with, with, um, mm -hmm. with vSphere or vCenter, you would use their policy orchestration engine to manage all these smart NICs and make them do stuff, whatever the <laughs> stuff is. So, that, so there's the, there's the next question. What, what is what are you making all these things do? Um, yeah. Well, you're, you're making them do, it's basically network function offloads that the x86 box that might've been running, I don't know, a firewalling service or something, you put all that in the, on, on the smart NIC so that the smart NIC just handles it off box. It doesn't have to pass that into the x86 uh, CPU. So for right out of the gate with the Pensando solution, you can do a load balancer. Uh, you can do uh, telemetry of various kinds. You can do you know, core basic networking functionality as you'd expect. You can do storage services. They're looking, they got a bunch of storage functionality in there um, to offload storage forwarding. You can do micro segmentation. Uh, you could do, I'm running out of fingers, you can do encryption <laughs> <laughs> and you can do stateful firewalling. Those are all use or, uh, software services that that, that, that NIC can do mm -hmm. without having to hand that functionality up to the x86 box. Okay. This is, it's interesting from a few different aspects. First, you, you mentioned that the founders of this were also responsible for UCS. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's worked on a UCS system knows that one of the core strengths of the UCS system is the NIC. The ability on a UCS system to carve up their NIC, their hardware NIC, into multiple virtual network interfaces that can do a number of different smart type things, including storage. So you could have the same NIC serving fiber channel duty as well as yep. doing regular IP or iSCSI all at the same time, all as virtual NICs attached to the same. So this is like, okay, we've, we've yep. done this before. This is not yeah. net new. So, okay, they've got a solid background in being able to design a chip that is smart enough to do this sort of thing. The other thing I would say is the offload of a general purpose CPU onto these 
custom chips is something that is happening across the board within server motherboards because right now the choke point is that CPU. Yes. Intel has struggled to improve their performance and get down to the smaller nanometer sizes. So mm -hmm. that's been a difficult problem. They've also struggled with the whole speculative execution flaws. So now CPUs in theory are running slower. And at the same time, you have all this excess capacity on the system board and the NICs mm -hmm. that could do a lot more. Hey, let's create these specific purpose chips that can offload some of the responsibilities of what's going on in that CPU. So you have that with GPUs and TPUs and now with smart NICs. Okay, that all makes sense. I I'm like, I'm with you on all this. The part that I stick on is you got to, okay, it can be a load balancer. It can be a stateful firewall. It can do okay. encryption. The software that is doing all this network functionality, is this specific to Pensando or are they allowing you to bring your own firewall, bring your own load balancer of choice and just have the NIC take over that functionality for you? Because for me, that's an important distinction. Do I trust them to make the world's best load balancer or do I want to use one that I battle tested before just using leveraging their better hardware? So they didn't get into partnerships. Um, they didn't say that there weren't any, but they didn't present that out of the gate. My uh, belief from the way they presented this is this is functionality you're getting in their orchestration tool, the, uh, the, mm. the, the PSM, the policy services manager. And in fact, along the way that one of the demos was building a centralized firewall policy. Then in PSM, you build the policy, you push that out to the NICs, the policy could be something like traditional uh, five tuple source address, destination address, source destination port, et cetera. And then um, uh, put that in as a, uh, as a filtering flow record or use uh, groups and uh, tags to create your firewall policy, which is something that's a lot more scalable, especially as you get into size. Mm -hmm. And they compared it to the way VMware NSX firewall policy uh, works. It, not to be clear here, they compared it to, they didn't say, if you're running NSX, you can feed this into our orchestrator and, you know, we'll push that policy into these NICs. Right. So, you know, will that happen at some point? I, I don't know. And in fact, I, as I was writing down pros and cons for this solution as I thought about it, um, I felt like the proprietariness of this whole thing was a, you know, maybe a negative. It gives you some lock-in. They didn't talk about alignment with other vendors and other software that you might be using. Um, so I'm not... You know, I'm not sure about that bit yet or how concerned I am one way or the other. They right. wanted to sell you the whole system. They weren't selling you hardware with an API and said, we'll integrate with the world. They, they gave you a full-on solution end to end. Um, mm -hmm. it, now, I want to I go back to some pros, though, here, Ned, because you mentioned the problem of, of needing to offload x86. And that is one of the things Pensando cited. They said, yep, anything that we can do to get more compute running on those x86 and less auxiliary functions, that's good because it saves on CPU, saves in your data center footprint. They also made the point, hey, these cards on the average, they're running 30 watts or less of power draw. So they're not you know, big animals that you need tons and tons of power. You can, you can put them into an existing server. 30 watts of power draw isn't a huge budget that's required there. And you can run these things in a, in a very large network. You can go with a significant scale. Today, you can put in a thousand of these things and manage them centrally. And I believe 3,000, they're going to be going to very soon. We'd be to manage them as one cluster and have them work as one integrated system. Um, mm. So that's, that's a platform you can build a pretty complex suite of applications on. Right. Who's going to build that, though? That's what my mind goes to is you're targeting the largest of enterprises, the largest of providers. Guess what? They already have an automation system and a centralized management system, and they have a policy system. That they don't want to rewrite everything to use yours. So let's go of, back to my cons. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I was thinking like, <laughs> go ahead. So, okay, so you've got this system they've built that's incredibly capable and powerful from people that know what they're doing, building hardware and software. Okay. 
But on the negative side, who's going to consume this thing? Well, I don't know that the average enterprise wants this. I think of them as typically, uh, and, and kind of some of the people they cited were extremely large enterprises with very specific application use cases. They compare themselves to maybe you're building a cloud. You know how AWS bought Annapurna? It's kind of like that. They made that comparison at one point in the presentation uh, as well. So who are they targeting? Not most of us, I mean, it's kind of a specific customer who operates at absolutely huge scale and is trying to deliver very specific applications with a very specific kind of a, a problem that they need to solve relating to their footprint, you know, and these kind of things. Pensando didn't bring up costs at all, dude. They didn't talk about CapEx and OpEx. They talked a little bit about ROI. Oh. They're like, oh, you can, you know, your ROI calculation is going to be that power savings was 30 watts or less. It's going to be x86. You don't have to have, you, you know, you, we just freed up a bunch of that for you with all the offload. Mm -hmm. That's your ROI. And I went, yeah, because the, the deployment model that they said was Greenfield, not crack open all your x86 boxes that you got now and slap one of these cards in there right so where's my how, how do i how does the roi work there i don't get it it doesn't rois are generally just complete malarkey and you could ignore <laughs> anybody who says tco or roi in a presentation because they are just blowing smoke so we can just move <laughs> right past that what i'm thinking is and they probably i don't know if they brought this up because i didn't hear you mention it the edge yeah okay okay so Massive hardware deployments, mm -hmm. and that sounds like edge infrastructure, needing to control the policy and tagging, needing it to be more energy efficient, and needing it to offload critical functions from x86 into a separate processor. Yeah, hmm. I'm thinking of all of those things, and I'm thinking of how edge is probably going to evolve, and this seems like a perfect solution for the edge. It wasn't what they emphasized. I'm trying to remember the different use cases they were going through at the end. Certainly 5G came up. So that, that does make sense that you would put this at the edge. I, I agree, especially since you've got centralized uh, control where you'd want to be putting a central uh, policy that you roll out to a whole bunch of different locations you know, at once that gets your operations costs down. But uh, I'll just counter with, if you look at what some of the edge models are doing. Yes, there are increasingly proprietary solutions in the space, but if you look at what the service providers, cloud operators are doing to try to control costs, they've gone to x86, uh, COTS, open source software, white box switching, network disaggregation. I'm rolling my own, I'm building my own apps. And Pensando was the opposite of all of that. Mm -hmm. <sighs> and usually I would sell that into an enterprise, right? Because enterprises mm. don't want to roll it. They just want to buy it. And if you look back at all of the other success stories that the people that found a Pensando have, it's been largely an enterprise play. So this does feel like a bit of a different market for them to go into. One of the key things to do when you're building a startup is to identify the product, the need in the marketplace and develop a product around that need. And then being able to pivot a little bit when you realize that you miscalculated on what the actual need is hmm. i would posit and this is total speculation here <laughs> but they thought they saw a market need within enterprises and tried to develop a product around it and they are mid pivot maybe i mean if we we go back <laughs> they do talk about all the problems that they were trying to deal with with the solution you know, providers moving intelligent into smart NICs, hybrid clouds, the new norm, east-west security as important as north-south, services shifting from physical to virtual, NFV moving to x86, NVMe in those fabrics becoming a thing, containers really matter, you know, which is a snapshot of what life was like three years ago. Um, mm. you know, things have moved a lot in the last three years and here they are coming to market. So it's, it, it's not like they missed the boat. It's more like it feels like a lot of these problems have been solved in a lot of ways without one massive overarching solution. But I'll throw one more data point here at you, Ned, because I'm curious to get your take on this. The two mm -hmm. major Pensando investors, Oracle, Hewlett Packard, HPE, Hewlett Packard Enterprise specifically. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So can I, I'll riff on this for a minute mm -hmm. and you just tell me where I've gone completely off the rails. <laughs> All right. So Oracle has a cloud. And most people know that the first iteration of that cloud struggled. 
the second iteration of the cloud. As as we talked to, who is it at? Snell? Snell Patel, yeah. Snell Patel. We talked to him, and it's clear that they've evolved, but they're still missing a lot of core functionality. What's a good way to bring in that core functionality? Why V3 of their cloud, which could include these Pensando smart NICs to accelerate their development of network functionality. That totally makes sense. I can see why they would invest. Mm -hmm. HPE, hmm, that's a little more interesting. And it makes me wonder if a few different things are ha happening. One, HPE is heavily invested in developing and pushing out edge systems. They have their edge line systems uh, based on the ProLiant servers that could easily accommodate this sort of smart NIC. And they're already on board with the NIC yep. or a daughter card or something doing additional processing. That I believe that's what SimpliVity was all about, was having mm -hmm. that daughter card to do that. So I'm wondering if HPE is on board for the edge side of things, or they have a large enterprise customer who they think has this need. And Oracle, I think they're just trying to get to the next version of the hardware that's going to run their, their public cloud. So how does that line up with what you were thinking? Um, I, that's really where my head went as well. Now, the, the, of course, this is just speculation in that Oracle and HPE are both so huge with so many different <laughs> BUs and possible uh, lines of business with different reasons why they may want the solution that it's hard to nail that down with any certainty. But, um, but yeah, you, where your brain went is pretty much where my brain went. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it all feels about right which means what's the long-term for Pensando? Is did one of these investors just swallow them up? Does somebody oh, like yeah. Cisco go ahead and just buy them? Um, since Cisco's got a track record of purchasing these things um, mm -hmm. from these folks that founded Pensando. It's an interesting question, but Pensando doing the big push makes me wonder what their goal here is. I'm assuming it's just customer acquisition for now. They're just trying to get some other people interested, talking to them, bring them on board, build up some cash flow while they probably sell this thing off within the next year or two if the, uh, right. the economy doesn't completely blow up on us. Yeah. Well, they're, they've walked into a unique situation where cloud providers are trying to grow like crazy to meet the accelerated demand. So they may score an easy win somehow <laughs> through mm. that immediate need. I'll also say that in addition to the speculation that I threw out there about Oracle and HPE, both of them and other companies like to invest in startups so they can get a seat at the table and insider information about what that company is doing to yeah. see if, are they a threat? Are they something that I should scoop up? Or, you know, I just want to be, have my ear to the ground and to pay, you know, half a million dollars or a couple million dollars to get that level of visibility actually makes sense from a market perspective. So, I mean, that could be all that HP is doing is just knowledge gathering. Well, another just, piece of this though, Ned, is if you look at the split of assets, there's hardware and software. Well, they built mm -hmm. a really interesting smart NIC. Now there's other smart NICs that are somewhat comparable out there, but you've got this piece of hardware now where they developed a chip from the ground up. It does P4. It works with massive scale. Uh, and P4 is, a, is a, an industry common language. It's not a proprietary mm -hmm. thing, which means someone else could scarf that up if they just want to use that chip or that NIC and program to it. You could build a product set around that. That's also a, an interesting saleable asset on its own. So it is a, a, yeah. a, interesting what they've created here. Hardware is difficult. Hardware is really hard. And if you have a team that has a proven track record in developing good hardware in the past, they might just push the software to the side. All that proprietary stuff we talked about that we were worried about, mm -mm, no, that'll just all go away. And mm. someone will lay their own software on top of that. I believe yes. that when ACI got spun back in, they rewrote a lot of the software that ran it. And I can tell you that the initial versions of the UCS management software was a nightmare <laughs> and required Java. So that's and, kind and of- they, they bought a company to help deal with that, as I recall. I'm yes. trying to remember the name of them, but yeah. So this might be a similar situation where it does get spun back into Cisco or it gets purchased by somebody else purely as a hardware play. And the software just kind of goes the, the way of all things, if you will. <laughs> 